Welcome back to our second part of EigenThings. Now we'll be looking at the application of eigenfaces, which is related to your second programming assignment. So let's start with how we represent an image if we're going to do this in linear algebra. So we think of images as a 2D uh, picture, but you can think of them as a 2D array of numbers. I can take those numbers and I can run along the rows and I can turn them into a single column vector. So I'm going to go for this matrix, 1, 2, 3, 3, 10, 2. I'm just going to start stacking it up, 1, 2, 3, 3, 10, 2, and whatever. That gives me a column vector, so I can think of every image as a vector. If I have an n by n image, the vector is of size n squared. If I have an n by m, it's n times m. Um, now, if I have a bunch of images, I can actually stack all those vectors next to each other, so I can take one or two images and stack them up next to each other, and now I can get a matrix that represents a set of images. To see how we might do that in MATLAB, uh, I can use the imload function to load an image. So here I'm loading a PNG, but I can also load GIF or JPEG or other types of images. Um, that loads it actually into a 2D array. Um, I can reshape that array by using the reshape command uh, to reshape T uh, into a column vector. And then I can, if I want to uh, build a training matrix, I can append the, that to the right side of my uh, matrix and append it onto the side. So that gives me a relatively straightforward way in MATLAB to load images and append them into our matrix. So now one of the things we want to be able to do is do some operations. So I can, for example, take all of those column vectors and I can talk about the mean image, the average face. Um, I can do that, in, again, in MATLAB by taking the mean of A, quote, R, quote, where I'm basically saying take the mean across the rows. If I just said take the mean of A, it would actually give me back a number, or, which is the, or sorry, we just go down the columns and do stuff. I want to do it across the rows. Um, and I can also use the command I am show to show me an average image. So I can get these sort of, these are two different data sets. And so you see the average of the faces is different. These have a lot of light background. These are all neutral backgrounds. Must have been a lot of people with mustaches and beards here to get an average that, like that. Um, but if the data is aligned, and by aligned, what we really mean is that the eyes and say the nose, are in about the same place, which is, we can get by doing an affine transformation, then you'll see the average face looks like a face. It has eyes, nose, in this case, mustache. Um, if the alignment is not very good, if the eyes aren't always in the same place, then you're going to get artifacts. You can see some artifacts here at the top of the head. Even if the eyes are lined up, the top of their hair might be very different. The bottom of their chin can be a little bit different. So you get all these different artifacts. Um, that's, but if the eyes don't look good, you didn't get them lined up well. So now that I've thought about how to represent my face, what I want to do for eigenfaces and for looking at rec recognition is to think of the face as being a weighted combination of some component or basis faces. So he, down here we see some example, eigen, or uh, what we'll call eigenfaces, base faces, where I can think of this face as a subtraction of this amount of this image, because minus, minus 8,000 times this image, plus 2,900 times this image, plus... 1700 times this image plus whatever that the dot. So we have a bunch of these images, and I can take a take a weighted combination of those vectors because an image is a vector. Take a weighted combination of those vectors, and I get a new vector which we can use to approximate an image. And as you'll see, we can actually approximate the images really well if we choose a good basis and make that work. So the question then becomes, how do we pick the right set of basis faces? Um, if we're going to start with some real set of images for faces, we then want to find the best representation. To do this, we're going to use a technique called principal component analysis, and we'll see why we're going to do that. Um, but let's first, before we get back into faces, let's just wind back down and get a better feel for what's going on. What is this idea of the statistical criterion for what we mean by the best differences between the training faces, the best representation, which is why we're going to look at PCA. Um, once we've found the right basis function, we can then actually reduce the faces to just this set of coefficients. So instead of storing this image, if I have these basis vectors stored for everybody, I can store a person's rep representation then as a smaller set of vectors of one number for each of our basis vectors. And that'll be how we store a face. So, so let's imagine that our face is a highly dimensional vector of pixels. And even though we might be in thousands of dimensions, we're going to start by just thinking about 2D. So here we have some data in 2D. Um, but what we really want to do is reduce dimensionality. So if we have our faces in 10,000 dimension, we might want to reduce it to 50. In this case, we have two. So let's just think about how we can reduce two dimensions into one dimension. But if we look at this data, in fact, your eye can't help but see this as almost a line. But the computers are going to have to be shown to do what we want to do. So if I want to project this data, these set of dots, into one dimension, what do I want to do? Suppose we take some random line through our space. Well, if that's the line I want to project onto, that's the 1D subspace, and we want to project onto the 1D subspace, we just take all the points and we project them perpendicularly. You can sort of see the ones down here. I didn't draw all the ones up here, but 
This gives you an idea. We just project perpendicularly onto the line. And that will allow us to represent our data in 1D. Um, as you can sort of imagine, of course, this is just one line. If we take some other lines, different lines will, will, will do differently. Some will behave badly, some will work pretty well. Um, so here you have a line where we project, okay, but this line will do very badly because I want to project all these points onto it. They don't. Right? If this line goes on forever, maybe they all eventually project, but they're some way out, somewhere far away. Their error is very large. Um, and so how do we want to measure what we want those lines to do? And so we're going to do that by uh, projecting these lines and think about the errors. Now, after I have a line, I can also think about doing this, although I said for lines, we can actually perform the same trick with a vector. So, because vectors and lines have, have a lot of relations, so given some vector, I can project everything onto this vector. And if I want to, once I've projected onto the vector, the coefficients actually tell me how to scale the vector to obtain any point on the line. So I project points onto the vector, and the infinite part of it, and then I can represent every point, and that gives us a way of looking at the subspace. So now, let's go back to how we're going to find the right subspace. What we really want to do is minimize that error. So what's the error we want to minimize? Well, first, let's just start with how we're going to, to first normalize the data um, in some part to, to address this problem of lines that are, that are a good representation, but they're not quite centered on the data. We're going to do what's called mean centering of the data. So we're going to take the average of our data, and we're going to compute its mean. Now, remember, for the image, that's a tall vector, but we still get a mean image. And then we're going to subtract the average, the average face from each of the centers, as we're going to do this for PCA. So the idea here is once we found the mean, now we know that the ideal line goes through the origin because we want the average of the data, which has now been subtracted out. So after we subtract it out, the average is zero. So the line is going to go through the, mean, the center, the origin, and now we'll have to just figure out what its orientation is going to be, which will make things a little bit simpler. To see how we're going to do this, we're going to, we're going to look at a property of what's called covariance. So if I'm going to look at this as a vector, from a vector point of view, I can ask the question for my vector, um, how does a vector relate these two sets of points? So if I think of a vector as expressing direction of correlation of the data, if I have two variables, x and uh, x1 and x2, as I vary x1, x2 may also vary. And in this case, we can sort of see that if I move to the right of x in x1, I need to move up to stay in the range of where are the x2 variables. So in this sense, we say these two variables co-vary. The y or the vertical component changes roughly in the same direction as the x component. They can co-vary in other directions. So we can actually talk about positive covariance, data where the, the two variables sort of lie together, and negative covariance, where increasing one means to decrease the other. So this relationship means that these two variables are not independent. A, re, a change in one predicts a change in the other. And so this idea of covariance becomes important to what we want to look at. Okay. Turns out we can express covariance as a matrix. So I have a matrix where the diagonal elements are the variance. The variance of x is standard statistical stuff. I just take the sum over all the, the data points of the value minus the mean and then divide by n minus 1. Oh, sorry, value minus mean squared divided by 1. Um, and the covariance, which is the off diagonal elements, is given by the product of uh, each variable minus the mean. So I have x, here I have x1 minus the mean and x2 minus the mean, and I put them all together, and that gives us a, a, a relationship that allows to do this. It turns out I can compute the covariance matrix very cheaply. If I view x1 and x2 as vectors, uh, I can just take their, uh, their product of x1 and x2 transpose, um, and that gives us a, the covariance matrix. So this leads us to this idea of what we call principal component analysis, which is used widely in science and lots of different ideas. At the high level, we want to represent our data as an n-dimensional vector, uh, sorry, n-squared dimensional vector, and our, we want to find things that are close by in this space. So the main idea for, for PCA for faces is to find the vector that best accounts for the variation of the face in the entire image space. So there's a lot of variations. We want to figure out what directions are, have that most variations, and then construct a face space and project things into that space. And you'll see how we do that. And, and because we're doing this for faces, we call it a face space or eigenfaces. Um, the more general stuff is PCA. So let's wind up. What's the general approach of principal component analysis? So for the algebraic definition of principal components, given a sample of n observations of p variables, so I've got a bunch of samples of p variables, we define the first principal component um, as the, the linear transformation of basically a weighted sum, a1 transpose times x, z gives us a, a, a new value z, where the vector a1 
right, which has got p dimensions because we have p-dimensional data, is chosen such that the variance of z is maximum. Right? So of all the a1s I could choose, because there's infinitely many I could choose, choose the one that, that after this prediction, z1 has the maximum variance. So if I choose a different value, we'd get a, di a different variance. And of all those, we want the one where it's maximized. That means it has the most spread along that direction. So it helped visualize that. Imagine I have data that looks like this. I have two uh, dimensions. Then the first principal component, z1, is going to be the axis where the data is mostly varying, which is this sort of uh, slanted but slightly vertical line. Okay? And when we do the principal components in a general sense, after I found one principal component, I can project all the data in a direction orthogonal to uh, that principal direction and then find a new direction. And I can do that in as many times as I need to. So the second principal component is the minimum fit to the distance to the line of the plane that is perpendicular to the first principal component. And if I was in 3D or 4D, when I project perpendicular to that component, I'll in 3D, for example, I'll get a plane, and then I can still do, I have a 2D problem left, and I, I sort of recursively solve this. Um, and even if I start in thousands of dimensions, we may end up reducing it to only a few principal components that are the directions where the data varies the most. And the whole point is you want to capture how much variation because that then lets you have better discrimination among things within those classes. So to see how we might do this at a practical level, imagine we start with some data. And so the first thing we do is we find the mean, um, calculate the, the center, shift the data so that that's now our new origin. And now what we want to do is take, this is our new coordinate system, find in that coordinate system the direction which is maximal variance. We'll talk about it in just a second how to do that. Okay. Now we're going to take that, and after we've done that, we can project it away. We can find the, the next one that's perpendicular, and so on for each of the directions. And that leaves us sort of a rotated grid, which if we want, we can rotate that back to a normal position, allowing us to have the maximal variance in this direction and then in that direction. Um, if we want to reduce the complexity of the data, even though we did two principal components, we can just project them down on the line and have one set of data um, getting rid of the extra axis and giving us just the coefficients along this line. Um, and in this example, we move from 2D to one-dimensional set of points to represent the data. Okay. So the nice thing about this is we're, we're reducing complexity by removing these dimensions. And although here we went from 2 to 1, pragmatically when we do PCA or when we go to do this for face, for example, we'll be going from tens of thousands of dimensions to tens of dimensions, but still keeping a lot of the data in a meaningful way. Okay, so again, we have our transformation. Now, if you look at this, you can now start to see how we see this as linear algebra. This is a kind of transformation from one set of axes to another, which is the whole point of trying to do linear algebra um, in terms of representation of mapping between spaces. So now I'm going to bring this back to where we were with covariance. Um, if we, again, we already talked about the covariance, and we understood the covariance tells us how much things vary between themselves, and they covary across the variables. And it turns out that if I want to figure out this direction of maximum variance, uh, this covariance matrix, by the way, is symmetric. You can see it's going to be symmetric because we computed it that way. Um, if I take its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors, the eigenvectors will be the directions of maximal variance. And then the eigenvalues will tell us the sort of axes that go along with it. So given a covariance matrix, I find its eigenvectors, and it will give us the, the, the directions of maximal variance. Okay? And this using of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to, to get to this is called principal component analysis. Principal component analysis doesn't say how you have to get it, but this is um, the easiest way to get them because this eigenvalues and vectors naturally tell us that sort of ellipsoidal structure we get out of this. Okay? And we can sort of see that the eigenvalue, the smallest eigenvalue, gives us the, lar the, the, the axes, and each of the vectors tells what direction they're going to be. So if you think of the eigenvectors as specifying a new vector in space, one can reference any point in terms of those eigenvectors. Eigenvectors, if I have n eigenvectors for uh, an n-dimensional space, they're just a new set of bases, but I can now use those to reweight anything. And a point in this coordinate space is what we're going to call its, its weight vector. So in 1D, if the point was this far out, then that would be its coefficient uh, in the, the first eigenvalue dimension, subspace. And we can think about its value in a second. And that tells us what is its two coefficients. And then we don't have to represent all of the dimensions. So if I start with 10,000 and I only use 100 principal components, I reduce my 10,000 dimensional data, my image, down to 100 if I'm going to keep a few of these. 
Um, and for many of these sets, you can cube, cope with very, very few dimensions compared to what the original space had, which is a big part of our point. Now, as I said, the way we can construct this is we can take A, A transpose, because A, for a vector, we did X1, X2 transpose, but you can sort of see if I want to do this for all the variables in A, I just take A and A transpose, and that'll give me a covariance matrix that comes out of the larger set of data. Um, now, there's a problem with that. If I want to find this, these vectors are big. Um, if the eigenvectors are an n squared by n squared matrix, generally becomes intractable. If I have a 10,000 by 10,000, if, if the size of the image is 10,000, right, which is not that big an image, we have images that are millions, when I go to do AA transpose, I'm going to get something that's 10,000 by 10,000, and then go try and find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. It's expensive and doesn't work very well. Um, but an important trick is that we don't have to solve it that way. We can actually use the matrix A transpose A, which is only of size M by N, so if I have 50 faces, then this image is 50 by 50, where that, uh, the, the A transpose A image is 50 by 50, and then we're going to use that to get the eigenvectors of the much larger 10,000 by 10,000 A A transpose. So to see how we're going to do that, let's think about it. If I start with the standard eigenvector equation for A transpose A, well, A transpose A times VI equals lambda VI, right? This is just a transpose A is a matrix. We can call it B and say this is BX equals lambda X, standard eigenvalue, eigenvalue equation. But if I take this matrix and I pre-multiply both sides by A, on the left-hand side I'm going to get AA transpose times AVI equals, I'm actually going to get A lambda VI, but since lambda is a constant I can pull it out and I'm going to see that that's just lambda AVI. And then I'm going to do a change of variables. I'm going to say let UI equal AVI. I'm just going to replace the symbols and then if you replace the symbols, you can see this equation now looks like AA transpose UI equals lambda I UI. This also is, is an eigenvalue, eigenvector equation. So UI is an eigenvector of A transpose A. So what that means is I can compute VI by doing the eigenvectors of this original equation, then just multiply those eigen, eigenvectors of this equation by A, which will expand their dimensions, and I will get UI, and I can get what I need. So, coming back to our faces now, I'm going to take my eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, and I'm going to put these into what we call a face space, which is actually after I've computed uh, the UIs, so I blow them back up. And in that UI space, they, if, we, if we actually show these as images, they look like this. These are the top... Uh, 12 eigenvectors for a particular set of data, and you can sort of see each of them still looks like a face, although this one's got an emphasis of uh, the overall mean shape. This one's got much lighter hair and a darker area, which you can imagine you might subtract off to get rid of hair and make people look bald. This one over here has got uh, a very white beard, which means if I have somebody who doesn't have a beard, I take the average face and I subtract off a beard, and so on down the line. Um, the fact that these look sort of like ghostly faces are why they're called eigenfaces. They are, they are the eigenvectors. They're nothing magical. They're just the eigenvectors we got from this process. Um, and now, given I have some new image, I can project this into the face space by just taking the image minus the uh, average face, multiplying by capital U transpose, which is just a stacking up of all of the eigenvectors we want. Um, each of these is a separate eigenvector. Just append them and, and project then. And that'll give us a set of coefficients. So the face spaces can be way to use to represent any face. So if I have two very different faces and I look at sort of what are the coefficients I might use to weight them, and here we're just going to see the value of, of different things. Um, two different people will have very different coefficients for each of the basis vectors. But if I represent this image, uh, I can now separate these two people just by looking at their coefficients. I don't have to worry about the image. It just looks like how close are the two vectors in terms of their coefficients. Um, as we're doing the, f uh, all we're doing in this case is treating the face as a high dimensional point in, in, in space, treating the image as a way of a being a vector, and so we can actually apply this, what we talked about here for faces, you can apply this to all kinds of problems that you want to do recognition for. As long as the data is really lined up, you can get pretty good results out of this. Um, so to do this, we're going to train this, we're going to calculate A transpose A, which is our covariance matrix of the face. We're going to find the eigenvectors of that covariance matrix, and then use these to get the eigenvectors of A transpose A. So in MATLAB, this is three lines of code. I'm not going to give you this. Um, but these, uh, these then provide a very simple way for us to look at it. These eigenvectors or eigenfaces uh, are the basis. And then we can project things using uh, this equation. 
so that I get a bunch of coefficients, which is how I can then represent everybody. Um, so we can use these in two ways. The first is we can store them to reconstruct the face from a set of weights. So given an image, once we have its coefficients, if I store the eigenvalues, I can actually do the projection, uh, I can multiply each of those and sum up the, the results and get an image. And I'll show you some of that in a second. Or we can use them to recognize a new picture of a familiar face. So I can look at this and, and use this for recognition. We're going to talk a little bit about both of those. So to go from image space to face space, again, just summarizing what do we do, we, we're going to see the face as a transform um, where we take the eigenvectors, the eigenfaces, and we just multiply them by the images and get a set of weights. Um, the i face in this space is then a vector, and the corresponding weight is, is wi. And we can co compute those for every face. Okay? So given two faces, if I want to do recognition, what I do is I simply look at those two set of weight vectors. And I, in the simplest case, I just compute the Euclidean distance between those two weight vectors. And I say, give me the closest match in face space. That is, of all the points I know. So imagine I have 10 people in a database. I can compute this distance for each of 10 people, given the current image, and then say who's closest. So I take the image, the input image, I get its coefficients, I see how close it is to, the, to, to all the different people, and then it'll say this is the match for that kind of face. And that's what you're going to be doing in your program assignment. From a reconstruction point of view, we can ask, let's say I take the weights, I multiply them by the eigenvectors, and I sum them up, and I keep normalizing it. And if I keep doing that, each time I get a representation of an image, because a weight times an eigenvector is an image, I can keep adding those all up. So how well do we do? Well, if I start with just 10 eigenvectors, and I take a, uh, a face, I get a pretty good representation with just 10 eigenvectors, even though this is a 10,000 dimensional space. As I add more, now I can really start to see the teeth, the, get, a, get a little bit more features of the eye. You can probably recognize this is the one we've been using uh, for many of these examples. As I go to 30, I get a, a much better representation. Again, the teeth are sharper, a few more lines in the eyes, a little bit more structure in the nose. And then if I go to 50, 70, 82, this is 10,000 dimensions, and yet with only 82, I get a pretty good looking image. This is another way of getting you a feel that this actually works pretty well for representation because as I'm recognizing this person, if I'm using say 70 coefficients, I can reconstruct an image of this person that looks like that. That's a pretty good representation and then I'm finding the closest things to it. So summary for this component uh, of our Eigen stuff. Um, PCA is widely used in many fields of science. In fact, it's a standard big data technique to reduce dimensionality. As we saw, we went from 10,000 dimensions to 70 or 50 and have a really good representation of the data. Um, using A transpose A versus A transpose is an important insight. If you forget about it, then A transpose can often be really big. Um, and this makes eigenvalue computations feasible for very large data sets with only a sm smaller set of samples. Overall, this sort of PCA eigen analysis is a statistical approach to recognition, including object recognition for line data. So if you can line the data up, you can actually use this for cars or, or other things. It doesn't handle out-of-plane rotation. Everything we did here right, was rotations where we're looking at the face like this. And, and with a face, because I can find the eyes and the nose and line them up, I can handle the in-plane rotation. If the head turns to be a profile, this wouldn't work very well. Um, and so the one last command with respect to what you need to know for your programming assignment, in, Act, in MATLAB and Octave, there's actually two commands. The eigen command, eigen of A, gives all the eigenvalues in L and all the eigenvectors in V of eigen. Um, but you don't necessarily need all of them, especially if you're going to do face stuff. Um, you might want to, to use even less. So eigen A, K gives you the K largest eigenvalues and associated eigenvectors with A. So even when you did A, A transpose, you might not want all of them because A, A transpose might be, say, 500, and you only want to see the first 30. Well, then you can use the eigen s to get only the first 30 and, and play with those. And those will be the largest ones, which are the ones that have the most energy. Uh, so that's a summary for part two. Um, good luck with your homework.